The programming of TV networks evolved as the networks themselves. They started by borrowing programming from radio, including early evening newscasts, variety shows, sitcoms, and soap operas. Over time, Americans began skipping the afternoon newspaper in favor of the network evening news. By the 1960s, NBC, CBS, and ABC all offered 30-minute weeknight newscasts to dominate national TV news until the cable channel CNN began in the 1980s. And remember from the last video when we learned Today and The Tonight Show were two of the longest running programs on television? NBC's weekly Meet the Press news show takes the prize for the oldest show on TV, premiering in 1947. It was almost canceled in the early 1950s, but Pat Weaver convinced the network to keep it on. As with entertainment programming, the ever-broadening competition from cable and online news sources has siphoned off network viewers. In 1980, the big three evening news programs had a combined audience of more than 50 million viewers on a typical weekday evening. By late 2018, that weekday evening news viewership hovered around 22 million. Originally, many new programs on television were broadcast live and not recorded. The networks did save some early 1950s shows on poor quality kinescopes, using a film camera to record live TV shows off a studio monitor. The producers of I Love Lucy decided to preserve the popular comedy program by filming each episode, just like a movie. This produced a high-quality version of each show that could be played back as a rerun. In 1956, videotape was invented, and many early comedies were preserved this way, allowing networks to create a rerun season in late spring and summer, thereby reducing the number of episodes produced each year from 39 live broadcasts to about 24 taped programs. The producers of I Love Lucy recognized the enduring appeal of comedy. Throughout its history, TV has aired both sketch and situation comedy. Most people are familiar with sketch comedy from NBC's long-running Saturday Night Live program. In the early days of television, variety shows drew heavily from vaudeville-style performers, such as singers, dancers, acrobats, animal acts, stand-up comics, and ventriloquists. These shows typically required new ideas for sketches and other acts each week, along with new characters and new sets. Besides SNL, popular sketch comedy shows have included Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In, The Carol Burnett Show, in Living Color, The Tracy Ullman Show, and Chappelle's Show. Another form of network programming is the situation comedy, called sitcom for short. In sitcoms, you have the same characters in the same places from week to week, dealing with an increasingly complicated situation that is usually resolved in some way at the end of the half hour program. Popular sitcoms throughout the decades include All in the Family, The Andy Griffith Show, Gilligan's Island, The Jeffersons, Cheers, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Friends, and The Big Bang Theory. Most of these shows centered around white main characters, with some notable exceptions. One outlier was ABC's Fresh Off the Boat, about a Chinese-American family's move from Washington, D.C. to Orlando. Starring Randall Park and Constance Wu, it was the first U.S. network sitcom to feature a family of Asian Americans as main characters in over 20 years. It ran for six seasons, becoming the first series featuring an all-Asian American main cast to broadcast over 100 episodes. Drama was another genre borrowed from radio and a staple of television programming. Because TV production was originally centered in New York, Many of the sets, actors, and directors came from the New York theater world. TV dramas typically fit into two categories, anthology dramas and episodic series. Like sketch comedies, anthology dramas essentially start from scratch every week, requiring new stories, new characters, and new sets. They were expensive to produce and unappealing to advertisers, and thus to networks. 
By the 1960s, networks were moving away from anthologies. Some of the most popular network anthology dramas were The Twilight Zone and PBS's Masterpiece Theater. In 2011, the cable network FX began airing a new kind of anthology drama, American Horror Story, where the story changed each season rather than each episode. Abandoning anthologies, networks turned to the episodic series. Like the sitcom, these dramas kept the same characters and sets from week to week. Story concepts are broad enough to accommodate new adventures, establishing ongoing characters with whom viewers can identify. These come in two general types, chapter shows and serial programs. Chapter shows are self-contained stories that feature a problem, conflict, and resolution in one 30 to 60 minute program. Viewers can skip a week or two and return to the show without missing too much. Example chapter shows include CSI, This Is Us, and the BBC's Doctor Who. Serial programs, in contrast, feature storylines that continue week to week. If viewers miss a few episodes, they may be hopelessly lost the next time they watch the series. Serial programs include How to Get Away with Murder, 24, and HBO's Westworld. Over the years, the lines between traditionally separate chapter and serial approaches have blurred, with some chapter shows incorporating story arcs that carry over several episodes, or even from season to season. Doctor Who is an example of that. While I would categorize it as a chapter show, as each episode is largely self-contained, and you'll be able to pick up the story if you skip a few episodes or even a whole season, there's often a loose story arc that is resolved in the series finale. Other programming genres have arisen in television history, both inside and outside of primetime. Talk shows like Good Morning America, The View, and The Late Late Show emerged to satisfy viewers' curiosity about celebrities and politicians and to offer satire on politics and business. TV news magazines like Dateline NBC, 60 Minutes, and CBS News Sunday Morning feature long-format journalism, mixing hard-hitting investigative pieces with feature stories. Reality television has dominated programming from the late 1990s. Inspired by MTV's The Real World, one of the genre's biggest successes is American Idol, which was the nation's top-rated show from 2004 to 2009. Much like the quiz shows of the 1950s, reality TV is inexpensive to produce. It features non-actors, cheap sets, and limited scripts. There's also a lot of variety within the reality TV genre, from cooking-based shows like Hell's Kitchen to dating programs like The Bachelor and talent contests like Dancing with the Stars. My favorite reality series, hands down, is TLC's Breaking Amish and its spinoff Return to Amish. Finally, there's public television. The Public Broadcasting Act of 1967 was passed to create an outlet for viewers underserved by commercial television. The act created the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which in turn established the Public Broadcasting Service, or PBS. The network is best known for its children's programming, like Sesame Street, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and Barney. One of its newer programs, Molly from Denali, is the first American nationally distributed children's show to feature an Alaskan native as the lead character. PBS also broadcasts programs for the 18 and up crowd, like Austin City Limits, news shows like Frontline and American Experience and imported British shows like Downton Abbey and East Enders. Government funding of public television has always been a little precarious, with funding slashed in the early 2000s. While the Obama administration restored some of it, longtime fans of PBS now often get their favorite content elsewhere. The BBC, who has long provided British programs to PBS, also sells its shows to cable channels, including its own BBC America, and to streaming video services like Netflix. For example, while PBS aired the original Doctor Who, the current version that started in 2005 is on BBC America. 
Likewise, Mr. Rogers' spinoff, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, is available on PBS, but has also streamed on Netflix and Amazon Prime. Even Sesame Street reached a deal with HBO, where new episodes run on the premium cable network for six months before they become available on PBS. As network programming evolved, so did cable programming, offering a greater variety of content and services, thanks in part to satellite technology. Satellite allowed cable companies to excel at narrow casting, delivery of specialized programming for niche viewer groups. Interested in cooking? Try the Food Network. Love your four-legged friends? Let me tell you about Animal Planet. Can't get enough of sitcom reruns? Then TV lands for you. One of my favorite cable networks is TLC. Originally branded as the Learning Channel and focused on educational and learning content, by the late 1990s, the network began to primarily focus toward reality series involving lifestyles, family life, and personal stories. Besides the Amish reality shows I already mentioned, I'm a big fan of Dr. Pimple Popper and I Am Jazz, which chronicled the story of a transgender teenager and her family. Basic Cable offers numerous channels covering a variety of specific interests like sports, music, and weather. It also allows for more channels targeted at marginalized groups like BET and its offshoots, along with Spanish language channels Azteca America and Univision and versions of CNN and Discovery Español. In 1992, 87 cable networks existed. By 2014, there were more than 900. Satisfied with smaller niche audiences, cable became much more specialized than its broadcast counterpart. Beyond basic programming, cable offers special premium channels, which feature recent and classic Hollywood movies, along with original movies and popular series, all with no advertising as subscribers pay additional fees to receive the channels. Another difference between basic and premium cable is that while some basic cable channels allow a swearing, as indecency rules do not apply to subscription services, typically only the premium channels allow for full frontal nudity. HBO is the oldest premium cable channel, joined by Showtime and Stars. While the movies they show are certainly popular, Original programs like HBO's Game of Thrones and Lovecraft Country, Showtime's Homeland and Black Monday, and Starz's Outlander and American Gods have helped increase demand for premium subscriptions. Premium cable channels also introduced pay-per-view for new movies or special one-time sporting events like boxing matches. In the early 2000s, U.S. cable companies popularized video on demand, this service enables customers to choose among hundreds of titles and watch at any time, features later copied by the streaming services.